Mr. Grobler, and I am here to help you with life sciences. Now, some learners have asked, can you give us advice on how to prepare for ass assessment activities? Now, I can give good advice on that because I've realized that in preparing for life sciences, in learning and studying, it's not about the theory and the notes that you have in front of you. You must get to the point that you understand that what you're studying about the human body, for instance, it affects you. It's not about theory. Like, let's say, the chapter on the kidneys. You can just imagine you've got the kidneys that you see in the book, in the sketch, here behind at your back, just above the belt. So if something goes wrong there, you and I can end up with serious health issues. So it affects you and I, it's part of the body. Now what we will be discussing today is all about what's happening in the environment. And what we've done as mankind is affecting us now, and I'm talking about you and I. For instance, the damage we've done to the environment could come back to us negatively to the point where we're starting to worry about where the next meal can come from. We're starting to ask questions about food security. Let's see what we've done to the environment. We will be discussing this um, lesson under five aspects. This is all about what's happening in the air. And with our pollution, unfortunately, we have caused climate change. But now it can come back to us in a negative way. Let's see how. Today we also will be looking at water. And we'll be looking at, is there enough water, quantity, and also the quality of the water? Then, what about enough food for all the people all the time? Do we really have food security? What is biodiversity? We will see what biodiversity refers to. And then, when we discuss solid waste, look out for the three R's. What do they stand for? We will be discussing this in this lesson. So when we deal with human impact on the environment in this section of the work, experienced educators around the country have seen there are certain terminologies that learners always get wrong. I will highlight throughout this lesson today those terminologies, because sometimes what we take for granted as educators is what learners don't understand. Please listen and learn so that you don't make the same mistakes as learners before you. Let's look at a few of these terminologies. We'll be looking at biodiversity. Now, biodiversity refers to the number of different kinds of plants and animals and other organisms, number of species. Remember, the word species means different kinds in a certain area. South Africa has great biodiversity. We're one of the best countries in the world when it comes to the amount and the number of different living things we have in our country. People even come here to see the different animals and, and plants. Then look out for terminology in this section of work, like fertilizers, because fertilizers have an effect on what we call eutrophication. But what is eutrophication? We will be looking out for that. Now, when we prepare ourselves for assessment activities, let's say it could be a project, a test, or exam, it's very good to look at past papers. So I've compiled a few questions from past papers, and let's look at the first one. It's all about the effect of building a dam in a river. Can you imagine what a dam will do to the ecosystem? Covering the part where there was normal land, but now it's covered in water. And what about downstream? Let's look at this question. The diagram below shows a dam that was built in a flowing river. So we can just imagine what it will do to the river. So look downstream. Where the dam was built here, the dam wall, it's damming the water up here, changing the ecosystem. So there is a change here. So we have made an impact in this ecosystem. Furthermore, we've built houses here, a small village, maybe a farming community, and here as well. So obviously, we're going to have an impact with our pollution into the water. We can also from here pollute the air, but for now, we will be focusing on the impact on the water. And what about downstream? Look at this trickle here, a little stream flowing down, not the usual river 
as it was before. So you can just imagine how it will affect the variety of species here. Now, what do you call that again? The variety of species? Is that not biodiversity? So, so through our um, activities we have in nature, we've made an impact on that particular ecosystem. But we have to live. We need water and we need to drive the economy. So people need to have agricultural activities. They need to utilize the water from the dam for uh, irrigation and so on. But unfortunately for us as people to create jobs and so on, we have had an impact on that environment. And that is what this discussion is all about, how to limit it. So let's look at the first question that we had um, in this particular year when we had this question in the National Senior Certificate. Explain how the presence of a dam can affect the biodiversity in the river. Now notice it's two marks. So when we use the phrase as examiners explain, it is more than just naming it. It's not name the effect. No, it means you must mention a point and then add something. Now you're explaining and you're getting not only one mark but two marks. So if I would ask that question in a test, would you be able to give an answer? How would the dam affect the biodiversity? Now let's see what would be a nice answer. This is probably what you also said. First of all, you give a direct answer. Because the question asked, how will it affect the biodiversity? And you say outright, it will decrease. And then you start to explain a bit, to add, so that you can get good results. Less water will now flow below the dam. And what will be affected? The migration of the fish. And now you will have a problem with biodiversity below the dam. The dam has made a major impact. But we need the dam. And that's what it's all about, the balance. So when we now look into that, we realize there's going to be agricultural activities around the dam. We need agriculture. We need farmers around the world to produce food so that we can have food security that you and I can eat, not only today, but also tomorrow and the time after that. But notice in the next question, what is the impact of agriculture on the environment? Here's the question. Still on that village, village number two that you saw there in the picture is a farming village that uses what? fertilizers to increase what we produce from the land. It could be mealies or it could be wheat, but what we're producing is our crop yield. So we want the highest yield possible so that we can have food for our nation. So what do we add? We add fertilizers. Can you tell what fertilizers are? These are nutrients we buy in bags in the shop and we add them to the soil so what we add into the soil are chemicals, which are nutrients such as nitrates and phosphates. Also, something like potassium is also important because it makes the plant grow better. Now comes the question. For five marks, describe, not only list, describe the impact of these fertilizers. What is the impact if we overuse fertilizers on the what? On the quality of the water. Now, have you ever walked in the area where you live together with somebody and there's a stream? What have you noticed in the stream? Aren't most of our little rivers that we have or streams around um, the, the neighborhoods where we stay, what color are they? Are they not normally green? Now, that is as a direct result of the fertilizers that have washed out of the soil into that stream. Let's have a look at how we would answer this question about what we call eutrophication. Look, here you have a typical example of these nutrients, like the nitrates we've added in the fertilizer, plus there's also phosphates, plus there's potassium and some others. These have been washed into the streams. And what you now typically find is a situation as you can see here. Now this, I want you to remember this word please, because the adding of chemicals to a water ecosystem 
is called eutrophication. Now that we want to limit because it causes the algae, the green slimy plants, to explode in number. Now that you call an algal bloom. And I want you to take note because these algae are going to die and cause trouble. So now let's see for five marks how one can answer a question on eutrophication. The washing of the chemicals into the river and then you have an indication of that by looking at the green and you can see there's trouble here. Because what is the trouble? Let me show it to you in the answer. First of all, we said you must answer, when you start off your answer for, let's say, five marks, you start off with a direct answer. The question asks, how will it affect the quality of the water? Then you make a statement, the water quality will decrease. And that is what we want to see as uh, assessors and as markers. We want to see that you give a direct answer like I've indicated here. But now the fertilizers, they do what? They increase the nutrients. And then you get this situation that we call eutrophication. The result is the algae explode in population. The river turns green overnight. It blocks the sunlight from entering into the water for underwater plants. The plants die. And when they decompose, what happens? They take out of the water oxygen, as I've described here. It decreases the oxygen concentration in the water. And who dies? The fish die. Not only are we losing biodiversity, but we get unhealthy conditions there. So do you see what impact we have had on the environment as people? We're trying to cultivate food in agriculture. We need food, but that's the whole challenge. We need to see what we can get from the earth, but still look after it. Now that's the concept of sustainability. You want to produce food, but you also want to produce food for the future. You want to make your agriculture sustainable. And any activities you have, whether it's in the industry and so on, you want sustainability. Look out for that word whenever you do human impact studies, even when you go to university one day. It's a very applicable field to the field of engineering and so on. We need people to be qualified in how to look after the environment that we can also be sustainable in our production of food. But look at now talking about the economy and so on. Look at the next question. Explain once again, not name. Explain. One economic benefit. So we need to live from the land of this dam for the people living there. Now, there are so many benefits, but let's just look at one. Our answer could be more people will be employed. And now we can even have tourism there because these people have to work in the tourism industry. We have created jobs, but we should limit the what? The impact. While doing all of this, we want to limit the impact on the environment. And that can be done. So we're going to have a short break now. And I want you really, if you can, to have something to eat during the break. And while you having that small item to eat. Think about the privilege you have and what I have to have food security, to be able to eat. Because around the world, the 8 billion people that we have around the globe don't all have the same security you have and what I have. Many among us suffer from food insecurity. So how can we ensure that going forward, we still have that food security? When you come back, we will talk about that. So welcome back. I'm sure you enjoyed something to eat. We all enjoy something nice and, and, and to enjoy our food. We said when you come back, we'll be talking about food security. But what impacts on food security? What is causing some parts of the world to have that food insecurity? Not only nationally, but also individuals. Let's look at that. So far, we have looked at talking about the atmosphere and climate change, but we have not really discussed much of that. But you can just imagine, climate change could have an impact on food security. 
We spoke about water and we said we're building dams to ensure that the quantity, that means the amount of water should be enough, and also the quality should be good so that we can produce food. But in the process of producing food, are we not perhaps threatening the biodiversity? And how can we apply those three R's I spoke about to manage our solid waste? This is what we will be looking at in this uh, next segment. So once again, I want to highlight a few terminologies where learners tend to go wrong. Let's see what they are. We've spoken about fertilizers. I'm sure that you know by now what fertilizers are. We've spoken about biodiversity and it refers to a great variety of different kinds of species and we need to look after that because we also get food from the animals and plants from nature. But what is green energy? We will see that green energy is the opposite of what we call dirty energy. What are these two? What are they all about? We will be discussing that. And how do we manage our rubbish? And this is where the three R's will come in. There's one word I did uh, not mention here, and these are pesticides. What are pesticides? Many learners get this wrong. It's basically poison. This is what pesticides, what they are. It's poison to kill who? To kill the pests. Now, pests can be fungi, like you have a bread mold. It can also be uh, plants, unwanted plants, and it can also be insects. So in the process of trying to manage these pests, we are poisoning the land by using pesticides. I want you to remember this word pesticide. It's poison that we spray for these three pests that we have, especially in the environment. So obviously, we want to eliminate poor farming practices. Do you think it's a good practice to spray poison to kill the bees and the butterflies and everything good in the soil? Probably not. But what can we do? Because we need to produce food. Now, notice as we discuss, and I want you to think, how can we strike a balance in controlling the pests, but at the same time not harming the environment? That is what we will look into when we look at some past questions. Here comes a question. It starts off with a statement. In recent times, we've had a scientific approach to farming, and it has contributed to food security. Now, while farmers strive for optimum, which means the highest or best millies and wheat you can get, the highest crop yield what Earth can give us, they need to avoid what? We need to avoid poor farming practices, and we want to be sustainable in our food production. And at the same time, we also want to avoid pollution. So we will now look at the specific question asking about poor farming practices. But can you think, before we ask the question, what do you think? If you look in the area where you stay, where people, even in the cities, we come out sometimes and we look at where people plant their, their crops, their maize and so on. What could be poor farming practices? Your textbooks have a whole list of them. I'll be just referring to two. Let's see which are the two that I'm going to discuss. Now it says here in the question, once again, describe. It's not listing. It's not listing. You must describe two practices for four marks that we have in agriculture, which could be considered poor farming practices. So let's um, look at the answer there. Here you see a picture of a typical poor farming practice. But this is what we typically see. Now, what do you call this? You need to know this word. What do you call this when we plant in agriculture just one uh, crop, like mealies as we see here? This is typically what we do. Mono means one. We only plant one crop. And it's agriculture, so we call it monoculture. Now, what is bad about this? Because this is the way we do things. Have you ever thought if a fungus would come in here, don't you think it would spread quickly all over here through the plants? Don't you think if insects would strike it lucky for themselves, 
that they will be like in a pest paradise because there will be so much food for them in here. So monoculture becomes a problem. And, but now, what can we do? So we need to look at alternatives. Let's have a look at some other poor farming practices. And here it says the problem with monoculture is it promotes the rapid increase of the pest population. So because there's a greater availability of food in a small space. That was the problem with monoculture. But I referred to also to other poor farming practices. And this is the use of pesticides. We need to spray pesticides to destroy the pest. But in the process, we also destroy what? Useful organisms. Now, this may influence the plants and animals in the food chain and threaten what? Threaten our biodiversity in that particular area. What does that mean? Let me just uh, show an illustration here. If you start with a food chain, a food chain will always start with plants. So let's say the grass is eaten by a certain herbivore that we can call number one. And the herbivore is eaten by a certain predator. And that one is caught itself by something else. And so we go down the food chain. The energy is supposed to flow like that. Now you spray your poison for a certain pest, but you also destroy this little insect here, which could be a useful insect, like a pollinator, for instance. You need them, but now you've destroyed the pollinator, which is a disaster on its own. But now there's nothing to eat this one. And now these can become a pest in their own right because there's nothing to eat this one anymore. And what about these? They don't have food to eat. So if they are gone, you see, if one is threatened, the whole food chain can collapse. And what becomes a problem? Biodiversity. Do you see the problem with pesticides? We should be careful not to overuse them. So, but you'll still say, and perhaps I can ask you the question, would you rather at home go hungry and perhaps have only one small meal per day and say, let's not spray poison. Let's rather leave the pest to destroy our food and then I will go with less food. Are you willing to do that? Probably not. So what can we do? We must come up with solutions. So there are fortunately some solutions where you can have less of an impact on the environment and still produce food. Let's look into those solutions. Now, here we come to a question that we've seen in previous papers. Now you must list. You don't have to describe. For two marks, list two strategies farmers could use to reduce the pesticides. Now, you'll find it fascinating what are we already implementing. We're implementing biological control. The whole idea is here that we move away from the pesticides. No poison. The idea is that if you have a plant, let's say here is the leaf uh, with his little stalk there. Now you have, let's say, aphids sucking the juice here out of the leaf. So what you would like to do is to bring a predator in, another insect, which is a hunter, a predator, to come and eat these aphids. Aphids are small little insects that are typical plant parasites. So if you can get the enemy of the aphid, a hunter, to eat the aphids, you are busy with biological control. Bio means living. Now, don't you think that is a good solution? It is, has been applied actually for a, a few decades already around the world, and it has reduced the number or, or the use of pesticides. So that is an excellent strategy but now you must just check that the predator you bring in doesn't create new problems. But that is for the entomologist to work out the people studying insects. So moving on, if we look at another strategy that we can use is to use genetically modified organisms. Now you know GMO products. What is that all about? If you have the structure of a leaf, and you can change the DNA inside the plant. Change the genetic makeup of the plant. Now the pest does not find 
this plant desirable anymore to eat. We can say we've made the plant now, what? Pest resistant. By altering the DNA, we call it genetically modified organisms, by changing the plant so that the pest does not eat it anymore. Don't you think it's a wonderful strategy? But many people are against GMOs around the world. They say, first of all, now we are changing plants. They say people are now playing God. People are trying to alter the natural DNA of the plant. So many people have resistance against GMO products. So it becomes an ethical issue. But GMOs can work also if there are no side effects. And that's what some people protest around the world. They say, they have big protests where they say, but what about the side effects? Have they been really examined? But I think you will agree, if the side effects are limited and we could reduce the problem with the pests without spraying poison, that could be something to, to look at. Let's look at more aspects when it comes to agriculture. Now, explain how commercial farmers that go on big scale can reduce their carbon footprint. Now, do you know what the carbon footprint is? All of us in our daily activities, in using electricity and our motor cars and so on, release carbon dioxide. We release it into the atmosphere. We also have, at, in our landfills, where things decompose, we release another carbon compound called methane. Now, methane and carbon dioxide trap heat in the atmosphere, but they both contain the element carbon. So how can farmers reduce their carbon footprint? Now, just to define carbon footprint. Carbon footprint refers to the amount of carbon, like you can see here, that we release into the atmosphere per year in tons per year. Now, this can be expressed per person or per nation. It can also be Our nation can also have a carbon footprint. That means the damage we do to planet Earth uh, with regards to the carbon emissions, carbon dioxide or also methane that we release. So the question asked here, explain how commercial farmers can reduce that. And I want to ask you, learners, what would you say? What can commercial farmers do that they limit the, the gases that they put into the atmosphere? Let's see. The answer is use alternative sources of energy. And this is what we referred to earlier, the green energy. Now, you know what they could be. It could refer to solar, that so many households in our countries have solar geysers already. We could make more use of the wind on farms as well. And we could make more use of hydroelectricity, which refers to water. So by looking at that, we would limit dirty energy which comes from coal and other fossil fuels that are used in power stations. If we could limit that, we should rather look at green energy and that would be a solution. We also want to, let's think in terms of our plastic that we use on farms. We want to rather reuse the plastic instead of producing more plastic. We also want to reduce, and here comes the three R's I spoke about, reuse, reduce, and recycle. That's what we want to do to limit our carbon footprint. So how can we reuse? It's by simply reusing the bags that we have already that we don't have to buy new ones. How can we re reduce it? It's to buy in bulk and the suppliers can deliver it to the farm. Instead of plastic bags, they can rather bring it with one truck and you can have a reservoir where you can keep this. Also, farmers can enter programs of recycling and this can help a lot uh, with reducing their carbon footprint. So we've been covering quite a number of aspects in our environment and the human impact on the environment. When we come back after the break, we'll be discussing that important issue of global warming and what's causing global warming. And then we will be discussing ozone because, please, many learners make a mistake with that word they like so much, ozone, 
I want you to look at ozone separately from the greenhouse gases. But we'll talk about that after the break. So by now we've seen that us as people have really made an impact on planet Earth. Why? Because we have to live from the Earth. We, we get our resources, our minerals, our food, we get from the Earth, including the water. But unfortunately, some people around the world have become greedy in the past. And now they're leaving you as the youth with a problem. And it's very easy for us to say as adults, you are the leaders of the future, solve it. These are challenges that we have to look at. Let's see what we've done so far. We've had a look at water. And we spoke about that we need to make sure that we have enough water. It's a big problem in our water scarce country as well. We also looked at the quality of the water. In the farming industry, we want to eradicate poor farming practices, not only in South Africa, but around the world, so that we can have food security. At the same time, we do not want to impact negatively on our biodiversity. We want to keep the numbers of different species um, we want to ensure a variety. We saw how can we manage our solid waste. Do you remember the three R's? Reuse, reduce, recycle. But now we want to look at this one. It's more than just air pollution. Because air pollution has led to climate change. Now once again when we come to this aspect of the work... There are some terminologies that learners across South Africa, year after year, get wrong. You will be interested to see what they are so that you don't step into the same pitfalls. Let's have a look. Right. Here is the first one. Compare the greenhouse effect to the enhanced greenhouse effect. What, what is that? We will be looking at that. Carbon footprint we have discussed already. But what is ozone. And I think this is the appropriate time to explain what ozone is. If you look at planet Earth, here's our beautiful planet Earth. Around it is a blanket of gases to keep us warm. These gases are called greenhouse gases. Can you think of a few? We can list them. There is carbon dioxide. It's naturally in the atmosphere to keep us warm. There is methane that actually traps more heat than carbon dioxide. Then there is water vapor. Ozone also traps heat, but I want you to look at the specialized function of ozone. Ozone is not found in the atmosphere such as these greenhouse gases. They are found here in the atmosphere. We're talking about carbon dioxide, methane and water vapor. Ozone is actually found in the stratosphere, up higher here. And what is the function of ozone? It's protecting us from the damaging rays of the sun that you and I don't get skin cancer. The UV rays are filtered by the ozone. If there would be a thinning of the ozone here perhaps, then the plants even and the aquatic life can be damaged and the animal life as well, including us as people that we can get skin cancer. So that's the function of ozone. So we normally recommend as uh, teachers, especially when it comes to the greenhouse gases and that blanket that's causing the earth nowadays to even become hotter in what we call global warming. We encourage learners to rather refrain from using ozone because ozone is a specialized layer above the atmosphere. It's actually in the stratosphere. We find learners mix up the ozone. They like to use the word ozone. But remember, ozone is in the stratosphere, not the atmosphere. When we talk about the atmosphere, we talk about the greenhouse gases, and we're going to refer to that a bit more now. So here comes the first question that um, I've taken from the National Senior Certificate of this year. And it said there, over the last century, human activities have caused what? What is rapid? Rapid means fast. Some people are not too familiar with the word rapid. Caused a quick global warming. That means it's becoming hot on planet Earth. Now comes a question 
for eight marks, not list, but describe the causes of rapid global warming. Now, maybe you can refer to four, and then when you discuss those four, that is how you will score marks here. So let's have a look at the answer. The answer to this is, what is causing global warming? What is causing the temperature of the Earth to increase? It is, we've got greenhouses, greenhouse gases that are increasing. Now, when the greenhouse gases increase, we refer to it as the enhanced greenhouse effect. Now, the word enhanced refers to making something stronger or making something bigger or better. It's the enhanced greenhouse effect. So, all these activities have contributed, unfortunately, to global warming, which has become a problem, and we'll see now why. Here's another one. D means to work against something. Deforestation means cutting the forests down. We will look into that. Landfills are basically rubbish dumps of our cities, and we want to manage them. And then increase livestock. How does that contribute to global warming? We'll be investigating that. So let's take them one by one. We spoke about the greenhouse gases around the Earth. If you have a simple diagram of planet Earth and you have this blanket of gases around the Earth, remember we said these gases, uh, two of them that I can just mention, is carbon dioxide, that's one, and the other one that's found there also contains carbon. Do you remember the name of this one? Remember CH4? is called methane. Now, what we've done with our activities on planet Earth, whether in agriculture or in industry or household activity or with our vehicles, we've had high emissions of carbon dioxide and also, through other activities, high emissions of methane. Now, that has made this blanket thicker. Now, it's like putting more blankets on your bed and you're getting hot. That's global warming. So this is the what effect? The enhanced greenhouse effect. You need to know that. So let's look at deforestation. What is the situation with how chopping down trees, if you have a forest, what is so bad about making space for a city or for agriculture and infrastructure? Forests with all their trees absorb here from the atmosphere carbon dioxide. And we've seen the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere is too high. It contributes to global warming. So we need the forest to take the carbon dioxide for the process of photosynthesis out of the atmosphere. But what are we doing? We're chopping down. D means we're working against the forest. Chopping down the forest and then we even burn the trees that we chop down even contributing to more carbon dioxide. This contributes to global warming. What else? Landfills. What are landfills? It's basically rubbish dumps. And when everything there decomposes, in the decomposing process, what is released into the atmosphere is this gas, methane. Now, methane is released from anything that's rotting, basically. Anything that's dying, whether plants or animals or the rubbish that come from our cities, it has become a massive problem, these landfills in our cities. Think of our big cities in our country. Some have millions of people. You go to other parts of the world where one city could have 20 million people. What do they do with all their rubbish? These landfills contribute to methane gas in the atmosphere, and that causes a trapping of more heat. It causes global warming. So, landfills is also a problem. Now, the next one you'll find interesting. What do we mean by if there's increased livestock? Livestock, like uh, cattle and sheep, they contribute with their dung, and even us with our sewage that we have from our toilet system um, around the world, we release from the earth methane gas, which really is trapping a lot of heat. It traps the heat as part of the greenhouse effect. So that is now something that you can go and think about. How can we decrease the numbers of our livestock, our pigs and our 
cattle and our sheep um, that we like to have meat? Is, is it a matter of that we should eat less meat? Well, that's for you and your friends to debate. But one thing we know is large numbers of the livestock, especially with their dung, can contribute to the emission of, and it does contribute to the emission of methane gas. So now let's look at another added problem because of global warming. Here we come to the question, now the next question. Describe the impact of global warming on what? On the weather patterns. And this we can do for eight marks, including in your answer how it impacts on food security. So how would you answer that question? You would list at least four things and then describe them for eight marks. How does global warming, the fact that the earth is getting hotter, really has an influence on food security? Can you make the link? Let's see. Here's the answer. First of all, there's going to be higher temperatures. So you write it down, that's logic. The fact that the earth is getting hotter, it means there's higher temperatures. Now, when there are higher temperatures, what is affected? The rainfall is affected. And when you have rainfall that's affected, what do you get in some parts of the world? You get floods in some part of the world. And in other parts of the world, you get droughts. Now, both cause damage. Because with droughts, you get D, you get desertification. The desert becomes bigger. And you can't produce food there, so you have a decrease in food security. So, in bringing everything together, let's talk about what we've discussed so far. We've now discussed in the last part of our discussion that if you have air pollution and you increase to the air the greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide and methane, you are going to have, unfortunately, climate change. And that could impact on our production of food in the agricultural sector. We've spoken about water we want to look after, that we have enough water, but that we also look after the quality of the water. Quantity and quality. Why? Because we need f uh, water also to produce, so that we can grow food. In the same time, we do not want to affect our biodiversity. We want to look after the variety of species, different kinds of plants and animals, because we also get food from that and we don't want the food chains to collapse. Today we also did something you'll never forget. Whenever they ask you about solid waste management, you implement the three R's. Do you, rem do you remember what they stand for? Reuse, reduce, and recycle. It brings an answer. So, in conclusion, I just want to refer to a few terminologies again. Let's have a look. We compared the greenhouse effect to the enhanced greenhouse effect. Can you remember what this means? To make the greenhouse gases more and to make the effect stronger, now it's getting hotter. We do that, unfortunately, by having a bigger carbon footprint because we release these carbon gases like carbon dioxide and methane. Then we spoke about ozone. Ozone is that gas in the stratosphere. Something I did not mention is ozone is actually O3. It's not O2. Take note of that. Then eutrophication. Can you remember what is eutrophication? To make the river ecosystem rich in nutrients that we're adding, it causes algae to bloom. Then pesticides are chemicals to kill pests. We should move away from that. Fertilizers add um, nutrients to the river ecosystem and it causes eutrophication. And then we spoke about the value of having many species. We need them. We could even find a cure for certain disease if we don't destroy all our species. So I hope you now realize that this part of the work that some learners say, now we're getting notes from the teacher, we have to study these notes and we have to write exams. It's more than exams, it's not about the assessment. I want you to understand that you and I are affected by this. And there are certain strategies to limit the damage to our beautiful planet. I'm looking forward to seeing you again. Take care and stay safe. <laughs>